All right. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dave. So today's webinar is on Trusted BIM, Accurate as Built for Project Coordination. And like Dave was saying, we've got a couple of fantastic presentation teams lined up here. Um, so let's let's get started. Just a quick agenda. I'm going to go through, do some introductions. Hey, Kevin? Uh, yes. Kevin, sorry to interrupt. Uh, did you hit that record button? I sure did, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so we should be recording, and you guys will all receive a uh, download link to the recording afterwards as well. So we'll get started here. Um, I'm going to talk about kind of the, the goals, give you an overview of the, the presentations that you will see today and kind of set the foundation for why BIMs are so important to construction projects. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, first off, we're going to have Daniel uh, Nishalak talking about a commercial building project. Uh, he's with Ramble over in the UK. And next, we're going to have the, the Canon team, uh, led by Les Carter, talking about a Technology Academy building and a project that they did. Both fascinating projects, um, a lot of laser scanning, a lot of modeling, and some interesting challenges. And then hopefully at the end, we'll have some, some good time to ask questions of our experts here. So just the basic rules of the road here. All of the participants are going to be muted during the presentation, so, but we do encourage uh, participation. So as our presenters say something interesting, if, if you have any questions about how they did something, about the techniques they used, about challenges, et cetera, anything that, that you have questions on, please enter the question in the chat window and do so early and often. So it's, it's going to be a first come, first serve scenario at the end. And we always have more questions than we can actually get to. So ask your questions in the chat window, just type them in as, as they pop into your mind, um, and then we'll answer them afterwards. So we will wait till after the presenters are done, and then we'll have the Q&A session. Uh, again, this webinar is being recorded, and we'll send each of you a link to download that recording afterwards. So within, within several days, you should be re receiving a link for the recorded webinar. So let me just set the stage here a little bit for our presenters. The title is Trusted BIM Accurate as Built for Project Coordination. And what we've heard from talking to, to hundreds and hundreds of, of guys actually doing this in practice is that BIM and reliable, accurate BIM has just become an, a, an imperative these days for successful projects. From the service provider's perspective, which I'm assuming probably the majority of, of you folks in the audience are service providers or interested in, in things from that perspective, you, you obviously want to produce a quality product for your customers. So you want that to be as accurate as possible and as usable as possible. Everybody wants to, to make their customers happy. Timeframes for turnaround are getting increasingly shorter and shorter. People, you know, as that's, that's the double-edged sword of technology, right? Things get a little bit easier to do. You can do more uh, with less, but people expect more with less. And so there's, there's a constant demand to reduce man hours and cost. And of course, you want to earn repeat business. So the higher the quality, the, the lower the cost, the, the less time that you can, you can spend on these things, the shorter turnaround time, the more likely you are to earn repeat business from your customers. Now, from the owner's perspective, BIM is, and, and an accurate BIM is critical. Uh, it gets the project into operation as quickly as possible, which time is money from the owner's perspective almost always. It minimizes the waste rework and ultimately the risk of a project to have a high quality, accurate BIM. And then if, a, if an owner is savvy, he will be using that accurate BIM for ongoing o operations and maintenance. It's, there's, a, there's a ton of things that you can actually do with BIM throughout the life cycle of a, of a facility. So in, in summary, 
accurate and reliable project information is foundational for, for project success these days. So with that, let me introduce our first presenter today, Daniel Nishalak with Ramble. Daniel, can you please give us a, just a little bit of background about yourself? Yeah, sure, Kevin. So I'm an assistant engineer at Rambo. I've been here about nine years now. And pretty much since day one, I've been using point cloud data to build models in you know, all sorts of software from Revit, Rhino, Edgewise now. <laughs> um, if I move on a bit here. Okay. Well, thank you, Daniel. Uh, I hope I'm not cutting you off. Um, just a real quick introduction of myself. I'm, I'm the chief scientist at ClearEdge 3D, and we've been uh, producing the Edgewise software now for, uh, golly, uh, six, seven years, something like that. And we do, we do a lot of work with uh, cutting edge work in terms of automated feature extraction and analysis of point clouds. So with that, let me turn it over for the, for the actual presentation to you, Daniel. I'm going to give you control of keyboard and mouse in just a second, but go ahead and take it away. Okay, cool. Um, so a little bit about Rambo. So we're a global engineering design consultancy company. I'm actually based in the UK. Um, and I work within the advanced engineering team. We mostly provide simulation, so finite element analysis and CFD, that sort of thing. But in order to produce that, we found that laser scanning was a great way to get 3D geometry. So we've actually been using that data for well over a decade now. Um, and along the way, we started building processes to use scan data for BIM. And we've been doing that for quite some time as well. Um, so the project I'm going to talk to you about is a commercial building that's in the centre of London. Um, and the, the project was all about basically building an as-built Revit model that's very accurate so that the design team could fit in new equipment around what was actually there. Um, and the client was actually a Rambo, another Rambo team, so it's a building services team. And what had happened on this project, they had designed a load of plant to go into this building that you see on the right there. And what, when it went to the contractor to build it, he didn't exactly build it to the drawings. And there were major differences, which you'll see here. So what the client needed was an as-built model so that they could actually fit in the correct services as per the design. Um, in terms of challenges on this project, the biggest was probably the time frame. So the client needed an immediate start and really fast turnaround. And because of that, we ended up taking over the survey duties from another company because they just couldn't meet the deadline. And the other big challenge on it was actually getting the coverage required to actually see enough of the pipes and plant and equipment, which you can see in the image on the right there, because the right hand half of that is where all the pipes are. And we've done about 25 scans just in that region, whereas the rest of the building has got like five. Okay. Um, in terms of our scan, the actual survey itself, we used a ZNF image of 510-5010C scanner. Um, as I said, this is a construction site, so there was the contractor was still on site doing stuff, so we had to work around them, and there's obviously safety aspects involved in that. Um, we did, we had one surveyor on, two surveyors, sorry, on site for one day. They completed 33 scans and captured about 3 billion points and then spent another day post-processing that in the office in Cyclone. That generated about 300 gigabytes of data, which we process on local SSD drives and bring into you know, Edgewise, in this case, for modeling. 
we had one modeler working on this, eight days modeling time, which was split between a little bit in Revit and majority in Edgewise. And in Edgewise, we modeled the walls, pipes, columns, and beams, and everything else was filled in in Revit. So in terms of the building features, the walls, for example, the auto detection features actually picked up the vast majority of the walls um, with a tiny little bit of clean up and extending and whatnot. The great thing about it is most of the internal walls it picked up the it could detect the thickness because we had scans on both sides, which is yeah, really useful. Um, the other thing on the image there you can see the blue planes they're actually levels that get taken into Revit, which is really handy, and all the walls are attached to those levels. Um, although Edgewise can do window detection, it didn't work very well on this building, but I think that's just because of the peculiar windows that are in the building. In terms of the structure, we actually made quite a bit of use of pattern extraction, which is Although it's not a particularly repetitive structure, there was enough there to make it worthwhile. Um, but actually the biggest time saving I found was actually just automatically sizing beams and columns. And this is great because it's not just a time saver, it also reduces my interpretation of what is actually there. I don't have to you know, look at that section profile and figure out it's a whatever beam. Yeah, the software is telling me this is the best possible fit. Uh, one other thing on the structure, some of the beams in the building here were actually fabricated from steel plate. And as it wasn't a structural model, it was more for reference and clashes and fitting new stuff in, I decided to just define a new I-beam section in Edgewise and get that to find them all. The one thing that I found was that you have to get these values in the table at the bottom here correct, or it doesn't go into Revit, <laughs> which is typical. And I've got a little animation here which just shows the walls and the structure against the point cloud. And I hope that plays okay for everyone. Okay, let's move on. Okay, for the MEP, the auto pipe extraction found the vast majority of the pipes in the building, which is great. There was, I'm not going to lie, there was some manual work needed to clean it up, and um, we also had to add in about 25% additional pipes that weren't found and connect the ones that were and so on and so forth. But still, as you'll see, there's really good benefits to doing it this way. Um, and just a couple of quick tips for everyone on this. Firstly, is just to be very methodical in your process to start in an area, finish that area. If you start chasing down a pipe run, you'll just get lost in the maze and never finish. And another thing for UK users is to use the US metric systems template in Revit, because if you don't have the right families loaded in Revit, you might not get all your pipes across. And there's a little animation of the pipes going in against the point cloud there. In terms of the final deliverable, um, we put together a as-built Revit model in just 10 working days. From That includes the survey and delivering the model to the client. As I said, that was an internal Ramble team, and they took that model, and then they designed their new systems to go into the building. And at the end of the day, it was a happy client. Um, in terms of time savings with Edgewise, with the old workflow of manually doing this model, I think it would have taken about 20 days. With Edgewise, we spent 10, as I said, and that includes the survey. So at least a 50% saving there. 
And this here, so on the left you can see what was automatically detected in the pipe model, and on the right is the final cleaned up model. And you might look at that and think, well, that's missing a lot of stuff, or there's a lot of false positives towards the top there, for example. But actually, the automatic detection has found the vast majority of you know, a bit of each pipe, and it doesn't take a lot of time to go from left to right. I mean, as I just said, in 10 days, including survey and modeling, we've gone from left to right. And in actual fact, the vast majority of the false positives in this model are ones like that, where it's a bit of scaffold bar under the roof. And as I said, in that top half of the model, that was really, really simple to get rid of. And I've got one more example for you on a different project, this is, where I actually spent two days modelling the pipes here in Revit. And as you can see, I also put it through Edgewise, and in half a day, Edgewise produced about three times more pipes. So, I mean, you know, at least a 75% saving on that particular project, which is just, quite just astonishing. Just to clarify, the, 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 the purple is, is what you modeled in... The purple is what I did manually, and the, well, yellowy, goldy color is the Edgewise. <laughs> okay. And, okay. yeah, back to you, Kevin. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. Great presentation. Very cool project. Um, and fast turnaround time. That's, that's great. Well, next up, uh, we've got a, a case study from uh, the guys over in the Canon group. Um, Les, and, uh, Les Carter, uh, can I get you to introduce yourself, please? Yes, uh, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I've been with... Uh, Canon for about 10 years now. I am the Technical Services Director of Canon's Land Survey Division. Uh, prior to coming to Canon, I've had about uh, 30, total of 38 years experience in surveying, and I've seen so much of the technology advance during that time. It's just phenomenal. Uh, uh, presently, the uh, lead uh, manager for an 18-member survey division uh, at Canon. And I'll have uh, J I'll ask Jason and Zoltan to introduce themselves. My, uh, my name is Jason Harless. I'm the CAT manager here at Canning. I've been here for just going on eight years. I have about 15 years of 3D CAT and laser scanning experience. I'm a ferrocene and like a cyclone registration expert. Um, also an ex expert in extracting the edgewise features from point files as well as BI and modeling. Hello, my name is Sultan Nagy, and I have over 20 years of uh, various design experience, and uh, been with Canon for seven years, and working with Reality Capture for uh, the last five years, mainly in AutoCAD and Revit, and now uh, we've been using Edgewise for uh, several years. All right, excellent. Thank you, guys. I'll let you take it away. Okay. Yeah. I uh, and I will give you the keyboard and mouse in just a second, but go ahead. Okay, uh, our, our project uh, overview is uh, Technology Academy Building uh, located in Santa Monica, California. Uh, the project scope was to provide uh, ultimately uh, a Revit, a precise Revit as-built model for phase one construction of the of the project. Uh, a little bit of background on Canon Corporation. Uh, we're just this year celebrating 40 years of professional service, service providing laser scanning uh, modeling, uh, laser scanning and modeling since 2008 survey mapping uh, GIS uh, recently this past year moving into the UAS UAV mapping market and pretty much all things 3D is our moniker. Uh, the company is full service uh, with civil, structural, mechanical, INE and SCADA uh, support for permitting 
and construction management grant funding. We have offices in Los Angeles, Ontario, California, Santa, Santa Barbara, Bakersfield, and, and we're here in San Luis Obispo today. Uh, a little more about the project. Uh, was a two-story, uh, existing two-story building with an expansion and a retrofit. So it was uh, on the campus where the project is, uh, space is pretty tight, so they wanted to optimize the footprint of the building and uh, retrofit the interior of the existing portion of the building. Our, our scan area was about 34,000 square feet. Our primary client was the college district. Uh, task was to provide a point cloud and prepare, again, a, a highly accurate Revit model that could be used by their architect and design team um, as a snapshot of where the, the current construction was. The client needed the updated as-built conditions of the building because things had changed. Uh, and it did require a high level of detail of the existing HVAC and MEP, uh, the existing uh, air conditioning, piping, conduits, fire sprinkler systems. Uh, unique challenges faced initially were the, the coordination of scanning during ongoing construction operations. Uh, as Daniel noted in his presentation, this is a key aspect of site logistics is just trying to work in and around, safely work in and around construction op operations. The, uh, the scanner lo locations had to be strategically identified because there was a lot of obstructions. As you can see, the existing materials uh, the, uh, that were in supplies that were in the building, a lot of equipment coming and going and in the construction materials. I just wanted to point out, too, that this image right here was taken from the uh, clear view. So it's an actual scan location. And this is a scan cloud image here. Key point, Jason. It's, yeah, that, that image and this one that follows are from the, uh, it's the colorized point cloud from the Faro scanner. They're not, fo they're not photos. Uh, one consideration on the lower level of the building, there was very dim lighting, and this required we employ uh, industrial quality battery operated uh, LED uh, lights to illuminate those areas so that we could capture uh, good color imagery on the scans. So another one of the unique challenges that we faced on this was the large number of smaller diameter pipes. Um, the automated extraction picked up a, a lot of it, but after it got below a certain size, uh, the rest of it had to be manually extracted. Um, since it was uh, so dense and smaller size like that, we actually had to do a significant number of more scans to get the coverage that we needed for the modeling and um, to get the level of detail that was needed for the Revit model. This image here is also from the point cloud itself. It, it highlights the, the, the conduit array, very densely packed conduits, and it's an example in the, the right side of the screen of some of the additional support, structural support and blocking that had been installed uh, that wasn't per the original design uh, for on the project. And that was one of those were a couple of the key features that the, uh, our client wanted to capture in the Revit model. This uh, slide shows all the wood, wood blocking that was in the ceiling area. And in this one, we used Edgewise to do the extracting of the wood blocking. And it's, uh, it wasn't an auto extract, but where you 
simply highlight the area and then it finds the, the shapes. And that's one of the features I really like using because it has steel and wood uh, library. So we can extract all the wood blocking. Uh, it was sort of semi manual. You select the area, but it accurately places the, uh, the corners of the wood block. The, uh the, you know, the, the modeling of these unique non-standard structural features was, as, as Zoltan noted, was really aided by the tools in Edgewise. Uh, and it, it, would be, it would have taken a many number of times to try to do this just manually without the, those uh, auto extraction or feature extraction tools in Edgewise. The images also show the areas uh, that were the piping that was interfered by the structure itself. So all the steel and wood that was in the ceiling interfered with the fire sprinkler systems that they required to be modeled as well. So onto the field collection. Um, prior to going out to site, we created a scanner location map for each floor based on the existing as-built conditions. Uh, those don't really reflect the actual as-built itself. But it gave us a general idea of the square footage and uh, general placement of the scans so we could do a proposal for the site. And then before we went on site, we did a field recon to verify the site conditions and make sure we had proper access. We used a, a Faro uh, 330X scanner on this site uh, so we can do a nice color dense point cloud for it. Uh, as Les mentioned earlier, we had to use LED work lights just in the darker areas so that the uh, color clouds would come in a lot clearer. Um, and then the scans on site were uh, done during ongoing construction. So that required a lot of coordination with the general contractor um, for site access and when different trades will be on site and coordination with them. Okay, a little little bit of a delay there. Go ahead. Yeah, so we, we actually did a 134 scans on this. Uh, the field collection time was about seven days. And just to point out too, this was done between uh, two offices. So our LA office did the actual scanning on site and then sent the data up to us here in San Luis Obispo and we, we took on all the modeling. So. Um, it was an existing multi-story building with the drop ceilings and interior walls and existing rooms. That's what they required us to scan. They didn't really need the interior walls, so that was a bonus for them. Uh, the project had to be in the contractor's coordinate system so that um, if, if other trades were doing design, everybody can coordinate with a, with a full model at the end. Um, and then the registration software we used was Ferrocene. These slides show uh, the auto-extracted walls and uh, sur surfaces which we use to, we first we cleaned them up in edgewise and then they, uh, transported them into Revit. And the advantage of this is that uh, it's really, it really places the walls accurately in the longitudinal directions and then you can uh, fine tune them in, uh, in Revit. Point cloud extraction uh, ran overnight, and uh, the other advantage is that this uh, minimizes potential errors in human judgment, which uh, is a key factor. Which, uh, and, and I would add that, and as Daniel echoed, it, it takes up a considerable part of the human judgment by meaning those surfaces, the software does. And so it, it, as Zoltan just noted, it, it minimizes the potential errors caused by our, our human determinations of where, where that surface really is. Just to elaborate on the modeling workflow, we actually started by creating the Clearview and Recap Point Clouds to work with that we stored on our local workstations to make it easier uh, to view the point cloud when we're modeling.
On this project, two modelers work together in parallel. One working on the mechanical features and Revit model, and the other working on the steel and piping details. And uh, a great deal of user extraction of smaller piping and custom structural details was necessary. But that, that aspect of the team working in parallel using the same point cloud as built as a basis will, uh, really helped save uh, processing time and modeling time by working working in, in parallel using the same point cloud model. This slide shows the uh, mechanical equipment. Uh, there was uh, quite a bit of it, but uh, this shows how we extracted the ducts and uh, then exported those to Revit where we did more tuning with uh, referencing the Revit, uh, the recap point cloud. And as Zoltan had noted prior to our session that the wall openings and custom features that were modeled in Revit uh, using the point cloud, uh, that was still uh, aided and the time was reduced by having having the, a, a precise and uh, truly trustworthy point cloud to, to reference in, in the effort. Yeah, and since the walls were already built too, all you really had to do within Revit is just cut out the, the windows and, and doors um, in certain areas. So our final deliverables to the client, um, they required a Revit as built, which reflected um, a detailed reality capture of the building. So that kind of explains the level of detail that they needed. They, they, um, the finished project was about 244 gigabytes of data. And um, we also provided the res registered point cloud as an Autodesk recap file. So, the edgewise workflow time savings. Our old workflows for trying to model this probably would have taken us about 160 or more hours to get all the walls and piping and structure in. Um, I think it's my opinion that edgewise saved at least half the time by doing it through their uh, automated workflow. Um, so we, by extracting the walls, the structure, edgewise uh, probably gave us a 50% cost savings on the modeling side. I mean, look, here we go. Uh, project tips and tricks. You know, uh, that, that it's always a, a key requirement to fully understand the client's needs and expectations. And whether it's an internal client, uh, part of your design team or engineering team, certainly when it's an external client that you're contracted with as well, uh, having a very well-defined scope of work and a, and a very specific and detailed description of the level of details to be shown in the CAD and or Revit BIM model is, is essential taking time and investing some time right up front and clarifying what those expectations and needs are and what is going to be represented in the form of reality capture in the delivered Revit model uh, I think will help clear up a lot of uh, possible or potential issues uh, as the project moves forward. Uh, for this project also, another key challenge that uh, Jason and Zoltan addressed aptly was the, the many non-standard structural fe features that had to be highly detailed, the infinite number of small diameter pipe and conduit and fire sprinkler lines and up to and including fire sprinkler heads, I believe also, that uh, the client wanted in the Revit model, and the, the non-standard I don't know that any ducting for heating and air conditioning ventilation systems are, are standard, but they were non-rectilinear trapezoids and curved features that uh, had to be custom built. 
So understanding that going into the project uh, will would help. You know, understanding those custom features that have to be modeled would help in your estimating uh, of the work effort. That pretty much, I think, rounds out our formal presentation, and and we'll stand by. I think that's that's the last yeah. question. We'll stand by for any questions. All right, excellent. Thank you, guys. That was a that was a great presentation. Neat neat project. Uh, well, let let's let's dive into the questions. Uh, we've we've gotten a number of questions already from the audience, and uh, I want to encourage you guys. Um, if you if you have additional questions, please go ahead and just type them into the chat window, and we'll we'll try to try to get to all of your questions if possible. Um, but just uh, as as things come up, um, please just type them into the the chat window and and ask for further clarification. So. First, pat first, first question here um, is for you, Les. Um, with the the uh, wooden blocks, um, and actually, let me address the whole Canon team here. Um, the wooden blocks that you guys were extracted, it looked like they were laid out in a in a fairly regular pattern. Were you able to use the pattern extraction tools uh, to to any advantage on that project? Not on this one. Uh, we did. I've used it in another project, but on this one, they, they were too irregular to to use the pattern extraction. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, curious about that. Um, Daniel, this one, this one's for you. Um, you, you didn't, uh, it, at least we didn't notice uh, how big the site was that you were working on. Um, can you give us a size estimate for kind of the scope of that project? You know, square feet, square meters. Oh, I don't know off the top of my head. I've not looked that up. Um, it must be about sort of 50 meters, no, a bit more than that. Somewhere between 50 and 75 meters square, I would have thought, yeah, in each direction. Uh, so uh, 50 meters by 50 meters? Yeah, something like that, okay. I would have thought. Maybe a little bit more than that. Okay, okay, wow, okay. Very good. Um, uh, it, it, this this is for both of you guys. Um, how, and I'd like to get both of you to address this. Um, how how did you guys do registration, um, and what what have you found in terms of, of targeted registration versus target less? Um, what did you use on on this particular project, and and do you have any advice for that? Uh, Canon, I'll I'll let you guys go first. Well, the methods we used for this was actually a combination of both. We we did a cloud to cloud registration as well as some targeted registration just to bring it on to the contractor's coordinate system. So just you know, with when you're doing the targeted targeted registration, just make sure you do a good overlap um, of your scan so that they'll pull together. You know, and so we we ended up actually having a couple different days worth. We had to go out back on site to get a little more detail, and so. Um, the original cluster that was used of the existing building, um, I took that one and created another one with the new data and then cloud to cloud registered those two clusters together. And, and then those those clusters were constrained or, or registered to the controlled portions of the cloud. Okay. So it was a it was a, a multi-phase method to utilize both the cloud to cloud the efficiencies of cloud to cloud uh, in a sense to help minimize the need for full-on targeting and then also adding in the controls targets the coordinates and elevations to constrain or register the cloud to cloud registered clusters. Is that, is that yeah. that's clear enough? 
I, it, it makes sense to me. So it, it's it's actually a combination of the two, and they 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 can both be useful in a in combination with each other. That's good. Um, Daniel, what what are your thoughts? How how did you do on this project, and and how have you used uh, have you used both types of registration before? Um, well, just to start, I'm not actually a surveyor, so just, you know, take note of that. But, um, <laughs> but um, as far as I'm aware, we used a combination on this as well. It, I think it was mainly that they used the the targets to do an overall fit, and then they just tidied it up, you know, tightened it a little bit with the cloud to cloud. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. That sounds good. Um, uh, Canon, this, uh, uh, Daniel talked a little bit about uh, some of the false positives that uh, they, they uh, got using automated feature extraction. This is something that I've, I've talked to a number of people over the, the years about. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts. Is, um, it, in your mind, how, how does, the, does the benefit of automated feature extraction versus um, the the time spent, uh, you know, cleaning up some of the false positives that that you get does does it outweigh the? Uh, what are your thoughts on the balance between those two? Um, well, to start off, those tools have gotten a lot better over the years. Uh, starting off in Edgewise, it wasn't as good as it is now, but the improvements are spectacular. And even when we had more false positives to work with, it still wasn't, didn't take that long to remove anything from the model. Uh, when you first start using Edgewise, what, you're kind of developing your, your pattern of doing things and, and how the tools work, so it could take a little time there. But all in all, once you get that workflow down and understand how the tools work, I mean, it saves at least, I would say, half the time rather than just modeling just straight through each pipe at a time. So the automatic extraction is a fantastic tool. And, and Kevin, I would only echo that, that the, what I've observed or what we've discussed internally is that the effort to clean up any, you know, false positives for lighting or corrugated pipe or other features that aren't in fact needed is, is just a fraction of the, the time saved. In, in the auto extraction, you know, tools. So, uh, I mean, that's our the team's experience is that the cleaning up of false positives is a very minor consideration. And as Jason noted, once you uh, once you get familiar with the tools that are there. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah, I, I've I've heard that from a from a number of people. I was I, I'm just curious. Um, uh, let me see some of these other questions. We've got a, a, a bunch of them. Um, can I'm not sure who to address this, who this question is for, um, so I'll ask it of, of Daniel. Can you talk more uh, specifics about the scope of work and level of detail of the model that you were required to create? Um, well, the scope, we were basically asked to model whatever, you know, the focus was really on the pipes and getting that in there because there was a massive difference in where they put the pipes and anything else was more just reference really. So they weren't after you know millimeter accuracy on every single piece of steel work it was or every bolt or you know whatever. They just wanted an overall picture of that sort of stuff and the main focus was on the pipe work. Okay, okay. Exactly. Uh um, this this next question is actually for me. Um, it, it, uh, Kevin, this is Les again. I'd, I'd like to just add a note onto that. That's a key consideration for anyone considering uh, in terms of the deliverables, the level of detail, but the level of accuracy required, if it's plus or minus a few millimeters versus plus or minus a few centimeters, <laughs> Uh, it is a key consideration, uh, and I appreciate Daniel highlighting that. That it's it's a when you're developing your scope of work, uh, understanding what is uh, for the client, and sometimes you have to enlighten the client as to what 
is actually providing the value to them. So if and satisfying their design or engineering needs. So if if plus or minus several millimeters is needed because they're prefabricating a component system and they need that to slide right in and bolt right up, uh, as opposed to as Daniel noted, so they just need to know that something's there, plus or minus a, a half an inch or an inch or something. So of tolerance. So the tolerances are, are, are a key factor as well. Absolutely, absolutely, and that that's that's got to drive um, cost and schedule, um, and all all sorts of things, even feasibility. Absolutely, makes a ton of sense. Uh, we got a question about uh, because because you guys talked about Revit projects, but we've got an ArchiCAD Graphisoft user um, and asking about possible workflows with ArchiCAD, and I don't. I don't know if you guys have experience with that, but uh, I know we don't, on the Edgewise side, we don't export directly to ArchiCAD. Is it, is, have, have either of you ever played with ArchiCAD and know if there's, uh, like, can you export from Revit IFC files that could go into ArchiCAD? I haven't done ArchiCAD, but I have taken models into Rhino and other CAD packages, so, um, and that's just going out to Revit and then out from Revit, so I'm sure it would be fine. If you can get it into Revit, I'm sure you can get it out. Okay. I've done some research on that because we actually were going to work with ArchiCAD. So uh, the point cloud can be viewed in ArchiCAD. I'm not sure about the exports from Edgewise specifically, but I know that ArchiCAD can bring in DWGs. So um, if, if at worst case scenario, we could bring the data into a DWG and then transfer it over into ArchiCAD. Okay, okay. I know we've spoken to the, the guys at, at, at Graphisoft, actually, and uh, we, we, we've got intentions to build that out at some point. It's just um, a little bit languishing on our, right now on our development roadmap. Um, but I, 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 I'm guessing you probably can export from, you know, in a, in a pinch, export from Revit and get into ArchiCAD through IFC. Um, uh, another question is, when you export your pipe models, are you repairing the elbows in Revit? Or are you exporting to some other format that you are bringing into Revit? Um, the... the under the hood, and I'll, I'll take this one because I, I, I know what's what's happening under the hood of the software. Um, the, the software, uh, Edgewise comes with a Revit plugin, and when it imports Revit mo Edgewise models into Revit, pipe models, um, it rebuilds the, the pipe model internally, and so it creates a... a uh, fully functional Revit elbow um, in the right place and everything like that. So it's actually, it's kind of going through and, and rebuilding everything once it gets into Revit to be, to conform to all of the, the Revit standards. So that's kind of, uh, I, I hope that answers the question. Um, Here's a, here's a question. How much of the piping needs to be visible for auto extraction to work? And also, what, how much of the diameter needs to be visible, is, I think, is the question. Um, and I'll, I'll let you guys feel that one based on your experience using the software. Um, well, I can speak to this one. Okay. Or, uh, I've seen it uh, extract cloud with just a quarter of the, the pipe uh, showing in the point cloud, but it's better to have at least half the pipe showing. Um, the other thing to take into consideration too is um, pipe, the point cloud scattering off of the pipe can kind of interfere with the auto extraction as well, so a nice cleaned up point cloud is better to start with when you're doing the auto extraction of the pipe. I'd mostly agree, actually, but um, one other thing I'd add is the you can get Edgewise to plot the RMSE, so the root mean square error of the um, fit. So if you plot that, you can actually see how, you know, if it is a 
problem fit as such. And that's quite useful. A lot of edgewise questions here. Um, one of these questions is, uh, in terms of cost savings, what is the cost difference between traditional manual modeling versus using edgewise? And how long does it take to achieve return on investment for the edgewise software? Uh, Daniel, if you want to, I'll jump in, but <laughs> we have something to say about that, sure. Oh, okay, I'll just go with it. <laughs> we've, we've, been with, we've been with Edgewise, and I want to say since it was uh, in a beta format, and how long, that, that goes back quite a number of years, but even five, you know, six years ago in some of our very preliminary applications for Edgewise, especially on the piping extraction, uh, we did a lot of energy, oil, and gas support, engineering work, and I and I wanted to say even in our early phases, if it saved conservatively 30% of the CAD user modeling time, and that was a, a hundred, let's say it was a, a hundred hours worth, would have been a hundred hours worth of manual CAD model or time, 30 hours, uh, I think, savings far exceeded the cost of the software on our, our first initial projects. So, so even, even as we were learning the software, it had a cost savings on our first two or three projects and, and paid for itself. I'd like to add to that too, the actual learning curve itself isn't that steep on the Edgewise software. It didn't take me but maybe a couple, three, four days to understand where the tools are and to become really super proficient. I mean, a couple weeks I was really uh, proficient in the pipe modeling itself. Yeah, I'd agree with the guys at Canon. Um, yeah, it probably within a couple of projects it had paid for itself in terms of the software. So I mean, there's yeah, and there's not much of a learning curve like Jason was saying. Cool. That that that's that's great to hear. Um, uh, we've got somebody asking the same question three times, so this is an important one. Um, does Edgewise manage Trimble TZF point clouds, or do we have to convert to an ASCII format? Um, it does. It does handle the TZF file format now. We're, we've, um, if you didn't, uh, if you hadn't heard, we are working quite closely these days with Trimble. Um, they are, they are, uh, they have a, uh, a Trimble version of our software. But even, even the the regular Edgewise version of, you know, the Clear Edge version of Edgewise has the the TZF file import. So that that works works beautifully now. Um, did you use any type of, and um, let me ask both of you guys this, because uh, I think this is an important question. Did you use any type of template for defining your level of detail on your Revit deliverables? Um, for example, the USIBD level of detail. Um, uh, Canon, I'll, I'll let you guys go first on that one. We did not use a template. We just uh, coordinated with the contractor and the client of what his requirements were. Have, have what, what about on other projects? Have you ever used a, a template to specify LOD requirements and deliverables? We, we're familiar with them, uh, but to date, all of our our projects have been client specification driven. So, you know, that's as Zoltan noted, uh, our clients haven't had to comply, but if, uh, I guess the, the response would be, if, if we were required to provide deliverables in accordance with any specification, then we would, we would abide, we would be able to do that, and we would abide with that, but to date, in the years we've been doing this, uh, we, we, our, our clients haven't required that 
we, we haven't been in the mode of, of like a building ins inspection to make sure that it's following those requirements. So we've been just doing the as-built conditions based on the proposal. So we haven't been uh, doing any kind of uh, checks behind how buildings were built to see if they fall within any specific standard. But this, this does bring up a key point. I'll, I'll make it brief. We, have, we work uh, recently for an architect. And our deliverables went to an architect, and they were not pleased <laughs> with our deliverable because we had shown them reality, and they were <laughs> they did not they had they did not relate well to reality not being 90 degrees and flat and the rest of it. But I mean that that was an initial initial project with that particular client who happened to be an architect. They were used to things being plumb and 90 and square and and that wasn't the rea that wasn't so we had an opportunity through that to to work with them and help them understand. So I was Zoltan prepared uh, conventional as builts for them that uh, provided them with, with what they needed to for their ongoing design effort. Yes, once the model was in Revit, we rectified certain things and aligned things to make it more pleasing to the architect. And it was still very close to the original, but we just had to do some fine tuning. And it, it goes back to the, the tolerances for the, the as built. If we're doing design BIM, you know, creating a BIM model from, from a design set, of data, that's one thing. But when we're capturing an as-built reality, uh, we understand. Hopefully, everyone listening understands that those uh, tolerances for the actual construction of a of a project, a facility, or building uh, may not, aren't going to be perfect. There's going to be a quarter of an inch plus or minus here, or or less or more than in the position of of things from the the actual design drawings. Oh yeah, I'm 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 very familiar with the tug of war between design constraints and reality. <laughs> that's always that's always a little bit of a challenge to articulate with a customer. Um, Daniel, let me wait very nicely, Kevin, back to the consideration for having, as you've noted, the the reliable, accurate BIM model to to serve as a basis for all the trades and all the design and engineering efforts, the, the accuracy of that as built, uh, and to the extent we're all you know, in, involved in creating that, it helps build the trust in, in our clients and helps expand the efforts for, for 3D BIM in general. Absolutely. But the other thing to bring up there is that different people need different things from that BIM model. So your architect might be happy with that wall being you know, 90 degrees and whatnot, but you give that to the structural engineer and he might say, well, I need to know that that's not square. So yeah. there is a bit of a clash there as well. There, there's a bit of a clash and a, and a communication hurdle that that I, I think we all need to get a little bit more adept at articulating to, to our customers because it, it, people who are not day in, day out involved in laser scanning are, are, are simply not as cognizant of, of real world deformities and mismatches with, the, with, with perfect 90 degree architecture. Um, and it, you know, it just probably has never crossed their, a lot of people's minds that, that that's the case. But that's, that's, that's certainly one of the challenges that we need to, to face and, and get better at. Well, it appears we've we've run out of time. I want to thank our presenters for sure for uh, sharing their insights into this this whole process, sharing their case studies and their experiences with with laser scanning and and uh, modeling. Thank you guys very much, and also thank you to the audience. I I, I really appreciate the the continued support and and big attendance numbers that you know it, it seems like seems like we, there's a lot of interest in this type of, of, of technology and just building a community around sharing knowledge on on how better to, to do our jobs so thanks thanks to everyone and we'll see you on the the next webinar
and you will get a, uh, just real quick, you will get a, a link to this recorded webinar um, in the next, next day or so. Thanks a lot, everybody. Take care.